to console or even to bring rest or relief. It was said of him at his birth, he will comfort us in the labor and painful toil of our hands caused by the ground the Lord has cursed. He will comfort us in the labor and painful toil of our hands caused by the ground the Lord has cursed. The Lord, of course, had cursed the ground uh, just a few chapters earlier in our story. When Adam and Eve brought sin into the world, God said to Adam, Cursed is the ground because of you. As humans multiplied, so did their sin. Read with me from our script, chapter 6, verse 5. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth. And that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. Every, only, all, every inclination, only evil, all the time. On the first, uh, as God was creating on every day of creation, God saw what he had made, and it had been good. On the sixth day of his creation, God saw what he had made, and it was very good. Now the holy creator, who so loves to bless his creation, the Lord saw, and what he sees is revolting. 6 verse 6, our script reads, The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created, and with them the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move along the ground. For I regret that I have made them. Uh, jump down with me to verse 11. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. Violence. We've already seen a snapshot of the violence as we've told our story. Cain killed his brother Abel. Maybe the scene was typical. The world has gone toxic against its holy creator, against uh, his order. What the God of love saw when he saw uh, was a crime scene. All he had created and blessed and called good was now corrupted. Corrupted, we read that word three times. Destroyed. In fact, when God sets himself to destroy, he uses the same word as corrupted. It's uh, in the language of the day, it's a very elastic word that can have several different meanings. But what humans had done to the world, corrupted it, is now what God will do. He will destroy it. It's the same word, you see. And by using the same word, uh, the story tells us very subtly but very powerfully that the punishment fits the crime. The sin of corrupting will be matched by the judgment of corrupting, you see. Uh, it's simply an eye for an eye. What God has now intended is just. It's fair. It's, if you like, it's congruent. It lines up. And so this is not a story, I tell you, that should ever lead us to question the goodness of the holy God. He would be less loving. He would be a less just God if he did anything less than the punishment fitting the crime. Anything less than flood. The character whose goodness we should be questioning is the character called humanity. They, we, made the good the blessed, the holy of creation into a den of wickedness, violence. And the God who created, he saw. He also saw Noah. Uh, look at chapter 6, verse 8. 
But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. God favored Noah. This is something of a hopeful statement as we tell our story because just a few chapters back, God favored Abel's sacrifice. Now God favors Noah. And having found favor, Noah lived upright in a crooked world. Look at verse 9. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. He was upright in a crooked world. He stood right ways up in a world that was upside down. He walked with the Lord in trust and in faithfulness. Uh, he walked with the Lord doing right by God, by the Creator. So when God decided and intended to send his judgment in flood, he told Noah about it. He explained what would happen. He gave Noah instructions, and essentially the instructions go like this. Build a really, really big boat. 6 verse 13. God said to Noah. 6 verse 22. Noah did everything just as God commanded him. God says graciously, and Noah does. And in the middle of all the instructions God gives to Noah regarding this boat is verse 18. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. A covenant. A covenant is a relationship based on promises for the future. A relationship based on promises. We don't know what those promises are yet. Uh, we haven't, we've only been given a, a short glimpse into Noah's relationship with God. But God is doing something big. When God makes covenant, we take notice. Uh, he covenants with Noah. We pay attention. 7 verse 1. Then the Lord said to Noah. 7 verse 5. And Noah did all that the Lord commanded him. What was Noah doing? Uh, what was it that the Lord commanded him? Maybe you remember the song from Sunday school. If you didn't do Sunday school, don't worry, I'll catch you up. It goes like this. Mr. Noah built an ark. That's what he was doing. And he did all the Lord commanded him. Look with me at chapter 7, verse 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, on the 17th day of the second month, on that day, all the springs of the great deep burst forth, and the floodgates of the heavens were opened, and rain fell on the earth forty days and forty nights. You'll remember the second day of creation. It's uh, the day in which God sep had separated the waters above from the waters below, he created, remember, horizontal space, space between the waters. This is what he did as he formed the earth for human habitation. Uh, he placed water above and he placed waters below. He formed it like that. Now he opens the floodgates in the sky and he opens the springs in the deep. And what he did by creation, he undoes. The waters that had been formed apart now join together again. Creation is being undone. The basic pillars of the universe as God made it on day two is being, are being uncreated. He is restarting the process. You know from your computer that half the problems on your computer are solved when you switch it off and then switch it on again, and it comes out good as new. That's what God is doing. He's switching it off, and we'll see if he switches it on again. Noah, meanwhile, he gets his family, gets the animals, and himself onto the big boat. And it's an amazing statement in our story. Chapter 7, verse 16, then the Lord shut him in. The gracious God who makes everything and has covenanted with Noah and has warned him of what is to come and has told him how to bring, how to build a big boat, now closes the door behind him. 
as Noah is safely on the boat, God shuts him into, him and his family, into his salvation, into the place where he will be safe, and uh, so to say, sends him on his way. And the rains came down in torrents. Chapter 7, verse uh, 21, read with me. Every living thing that moved on the land perished. Birds, livestock, wild animals, all the creatures that swarm over the earth and all mankind. Everything on dry land that had the breath of life in its nostrils died. Every living thing on the face of the earth was wiped out. People and animals and the creatures that move along the ground and the birds were wiped from the earth. Beginning of verse 21, every living thing. Beginning of verse 22, everything. Beginning of verse 23, every living thing. It's total. God is going to begin from scratch. And so the fitting punishment for the crime, everything dies. Everything. Only Noah, only Noah whose name means consolation or comfort or relief, only Noah, who was shut in for his salvation, for his preservation, only Noah was left with his family. It's taken us a while to get here, but we've reached the center of our story. Uh, the world is underwater. The holy wrath of God has been carried out. Judgment is complete. Look at chapter 8, verse 1. This is the center of the story. But God remembered Noah but God remembered Noah God doesn't forget this isn't about memory or God calling something to mind in the Old Testament when God remembers it means he acts on his covenant promises it means he he takes action on that which he has promised to do so read with me but God remembered Noah and all the wild animals and the livestock that were with him in the ark and he sent a wind over the earth, and the waters receded. Do you remember when God created uh, chapter 1, verse 1 in our story, 1, verse 1 and 2? Uh, before he formed anything, we read about this sort of wet nothingness, and the Spirit hovered over the face of the deep. Here's the same word, this time translated wind. The spirit or the wind uh, blowing over what is again a sort of wet nothingness, an undoing of what God had done. But there's hope again. The wind blows over the deep. He's restarting his creation. Remembering Noah, he is restarting his creation. And so after a period of time, the mountaintops become visible. And then that famous incident, the dove returns uh, with a freshly plucked olive leaf in its mouth, giving an early symbol of the hopefulness that the earth is drying out. By the, time, by the time Noah leaves his big boat, seed time and harvest have passed, a summer and a winter have passed, cold and heat have passed, a whole year has passed. In fact, exactly a year in the way we count years has passed. The world has missed a full cycle of all these things. It has missed it, a wash in God's judgment. But eventually it happens, 8 verse 15. Then God said to Noah, come out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and their wives, bring out every kind of living creature that is with you, the birds, the animals, and all the creatures that move along the ground so they can multiply on the earth and be fruitful and increase in number on it. And again, as we tell our story, we hear echoes of the first creation. Was it not God who said to the man and woman, be fruitful and multiply, subdue the earth and increase on it? This is their task again. After pressing the reset button, the whole of creation must get busy with fruitfulness and with increasing in number. Uh, I'll read from 8 verse 20. Then 
Noah built an altar to the Lord. And taking some of all the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma. Hmm. That word pleasing, it's the same as Noah's name. Noah's name means consolation or comfort or relief. This aroma is comforting or consoling or relieving. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, hmm, that's interesting. Uh, when the Lord saw the wickedness and violence and corruption of the earth, he was grieved in his heart. In his heart he was grieved. Now he said in his heart, he said, never again will I curse the ground because of humans. Never again will I curse the ground because of humans. Of course, he had cursed the ground. He cursed the ground because of Cain's sin. And he had cursed the ground before that because of Adam's sin, saying, cursed is the ground because of you. Never again will I curse the ground. Do you remember that Noah's name came to refer, it was that Noah would console or comfort from the painful toil of working the cursed ground. Remember? That's what they said at his birth. And now God says, never again will I curse the ground because of humans. Even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. That's an idea we've come across before. God has restarted the world. He has shut it down and started it up again. But the raw materials remain the same. The human heart that was inclined towards evil in every way is still inclined towards evil in every way. It's not a pathology that's outside of Noah and his family. It is within. It is internal. And because he has spared eight people from the flood, those eight people are still inclined towards evil, even from childhood. Yet he says, never again will I destroy all living creatures as I, I have done. As long as the earth endures, sea time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. God judges wickedness. It's devastating. It's total. It's complete. It's fearful. But he does it. And when he does it, the punishment is never more than fitting to the crime. And God's mercy to Noah is incredible. God is able to save and preserve through judgment. He favors Noah. He covenants with him. He shuts him into the place of his salvation. He remembers his covenant to him. And he brings him out to walk on dry land. And then smells the pleasing aroma of his sacrifice. Trust God to preserve his people through judgment. Now, this isn't exactly the end of the story of the flood. It lives on in the biblical story. Uh, Jesus, speaking about the day of judgment, he uses Noah and his wicked generation as a picture of what it will be like when God judges. And the books of First and Second Peter both reference the flood. They, too, remember the flood as a picture of what will happen when the Lord Jesus Christ returns to save and to judge. We don't like to think about it very often. But there will be a final judgment, a day of reckoning, a day of squaring off all accounts. And the flood is a precursor to it. The day is coming when, like in the day of Noah, God will judge. He will judge all unrighteousness and wickedness and through it bring about a new creation. And in fact, it's a day to look forward to. 
Instinctively, we think about it negatively. And of course, I understand why. At, at first glance, that makes complete sense. In fact, I think many people uh, find this idea repulsive. Judgment is perhaps the reason why many people aren't Christians. It's just too ghastly a thing to think about. But there's something much more ghastly, even, than God's total and complete judgment. And that is no judgment. Um, isn't it much worse if everyone who does evil and, uh, and sows corruption and brings wickedness and toxic nonsense into the earth just gets away with it? And never the scales of justice balance. Isn't that a scarier way to think about the world and a more fearful way to live? Don't we all cry out for justice? Justice is coming. Don't we all cry out for a day that will do right by the world's victims? That day is coming. Now, don't we wish that someday every crime scene will be investigated and every perpetrator found guilty? That day is coming. Don't we wish for every toxic behavior to get what it deserves? The day is coming. And the question is, where do you stand? Where do you stand for that day? We're very quick to play the victim, and sometimes we're not just playing the victim, we are the victim. We're very quick to point the finger. We know exactly how everybody has sinned against us. We can identify the evil done towards us very quickly. Yet, if we can see that in everyone else, it's not possible for everyone to be pointing at everyone else and no one to be getting pointed at. You see what I'm saying? All the talk of toxic, all the talk of abuse, all the talk of hurt, it's genuine and it's real. But the sheer saturation of our world with those topics and that conversation and those concerns means that we're all doing something wrong. It's a widespread problem and God is coming to judge. After the flood, God said in his heart, every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. If you look at the world around us, this just makes sense. The trouble is, if you look at your own life, it makes sense too. It's true of us. It's true of you. And it's true of me. Uh, spend a week following me around. Uh, you'll find it's true of me. So that great day of reckoning, the day when God, seeing the crime, measures out the punishment... Uh, the, the day when the cosmic scales of justice are made to balance. On that day, where will you stand? At the end of our passage of scripture today, we saw how the Lord was pleased, how he was appeased. And he was pleased and appeased by an appropriate sacrifice. The good news of our Lord Jesus Christ is that an appropriate sacrifice, a fitting sacrifice for sin, has been made. The book of Revelation refers time and again to the Lord Jesus as the Lamb who was slain. The author to Hebrews writes in chapter 10, it should appear behind me, but when this priest, that is Jesus, when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God and since that time, he waits for his enemies to ma be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Our Lord gave himself for us on the cross. He gave himself. A God in Christ took on our sin, our wickedness, our violence and corruption. He took it upon himself. And he bore the unthinkable punishment for it. As one theologian has said, the judge has been judged in our place. The judge has been judged in our place. And the outcome's there for us in verse 14. He has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Perfect forever. God counts us by his grace as perfect, as righteous, as upright, as just in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's God's grace to us. 
We are counted perfect forever. Not just perfect today and tomorrow there'll have to be some other sacrifice made for sin. Not just perfect for the duration of our lives. Not just perfect going forward but ignoring what's behind us. Not just perfect until the day of judgment but then we better by then have our act together. He has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Uh, so 2 Peter 3, remembering the flood, uh, verse 5 and then verse 9. If God did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others, if this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to hold the unrighteous for punishment on the day of judgment. God knows how to hold the righteous. He favored Noah, setting his grace on him. He warned him of what was coming. He walked with him. He covenanted with him. He closed the door of the ark to seal him into his salvation. He remembered him and restarted the world as the flood waters drew back. He set his feet back on dry ground. He smelled the pleasing aroma of his sacrifice. The Lord knows how to save and preserve his people through judgment. Those in Christ, those rescued by the sacrifice the Lord Jesus has made for sins forever, those in Christ have nothing to fear. Nothing to fear. And no reason to hedge our bets. You know, you know what I think would happen if we really believed this? Like really if we actually did what would happen? I think we'd stop hedging our bets. You know in, in finance or in investment. I'm not very good at those things. But they say that having a diverse portfolio is important. You know you, you, you can't put all your eggs in one box if you want your eggs to be safe. But that's not the way we live our lives in faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. If God is able to preserve and save those he has called to be his own, then we put all of our eggs in one basket. We go wholeheartedly and we go single-mindedly for the Lord Jesus Christ. We walk faithfully and in trust with him. There's no need uh, to put our trust in the I idols of our own making, in lesser gods, in other places we think we might find security or pleasure or life. We go single-mindedly and wholeheartedly for the Lord Jesus Christ because He will keep us for that day and He will keep us on that day and we will know life, eternal life, through Him. Amen. Well, I'll give you a moment to reflect, and then I will lead us in prayer.